Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up and we've been talking a lot about satellite internet services here on the channel over the last two weeks. And I thought I would continue that theme this week, but look at another planet. So today we're going to be focusing on Mars and how NASA gets data from Mars to us here on the ground on planet Earth. And what prompted me to do this video was this amazing footage they released today of the Mars Perseverance rover landing on the planet. It's amazing. We're going to check out that clip first, and then we're going to figure out how they got it here. So let's get to it. So let's take a look at that amazing footage from Mars. This came in over the weekend. It took them a little while to get it transferred down. Uh, this is the parachute deployment. They were very interested to see what it looks like to deploy a parachute like this on Mars with a much thinner atmosphere. Uh, this is the heat shield getting jettisoned from the bottom of the spacecraft when it was no longer needed. They said during the press conference today that they saw some parts hanging off of it that they didn't expect to see hanging off, so that might help inform future engineering decisions. They've never actually seen this work at all uh, because they were unable to test the system on Earth in its entirety. So this is the first time a lot of the engineers are actually getting a look at what they created, which is amazing. Uh, here you can see the surface coming into view. Uh, this is it landing propulsively with the rocket sky crane combo. And what you're going to see here in a second is the rover getting lowered down from that sky crane. So the top image is going to be the rover looking up at the sky crane and the lower image is the sky crane looking down at the rover. And once the rover gets deposited on the ground and they've confirmed touchdown, uh, the sky crane detaches from the rover. And when that detachment occurs, you'll lose the video coming from the sky crane because the cable was transmitting the data <laughs> to the rover to record it. And then it flies away. I did some slow motion clips here too, so you can get a little bit more detail on the whole process here. Uh, but this is just extraordinary footage coming down from the rover. It looks like they sent it down frame by frame from what I gathered on the press conference today. And there's actually a little Intel mini PC that is on the rover running Linux and FFmpeg to do some of the video processing. So as a computer nerd, a video nerd, and a space nerd, it's fun to have a story to talk about that converges all of those things together on the surface of another planet. Pretty cool stuff. But how did they get the video here? Let's find out about that. Now, there is no internet on Mars at the moment, but if we were to run a speed test, this is kind of what you might expect. Uh, the ping rate is going to be about 1.4 million milliseconds, uh, and that's because right now the light time to Mars round trip is about 22 minutes. It's 11 minutes and change each way. I think the math would come in a little bit lower than 1.4 million, but it's in that ballpark. And then the bandwidth that the new rover on Mars can transmit at is about two megabits per second to a relay satellite. So it's actually pretty good and actually faster perhaps than some DSL connections here on Earth, including the one at my brother's place in Vermont that uh, we just took a look at. Uh, so it is possible to get a good volume of data off the planet, but this is not a direct to Earth connection. It actually goes through a network of relay satellites that are orbiting the planet. Pretty cool stuff. And we're going to talk about that as we make our way through the video here. Now, when we did the live stream last week, a lot of you were asking, why is this all we see of the landing? We had the uh, computer graphics here of what was happening to the rover as it was going down to the surface. We saw uh, video images, of course, of mission control at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but we didn't get any live video of the rover hitting the ground, or landing on the ground, I should say. All we got was this, and this was me uh, doing that live stream, providing some uh, commentary on the whole thing. And the reason that we're not getting that kind of video, even though they do have the potential for high bandwidth from the surface of the planet, is because of all of the complexities in getting radio signals from this vehicle back to Earth. And the big challenge with getting data back in real time to Earth is all of the different antenna systems that have to be switched very quickly as this thing makes its way down to the ground. So on the way to Mars, there was the cruise stage, which had solar panels for power, and it had antennas that would communicate back with Earth directly. But as they got closer to the planet, they had to ditch the cruise stage. And of course, the antennas that it was using to transmit had to be switched to antennas on the cruise stage itself. So the top part was jettisoned. 
Uh, this lower portion here, the back shell, along with its heat shield, uh, then entered the atmosphere, and they were communicating to Earth through very low bandwidth pings uh, with these antennas up here. And then, after the back shell was ditched, they had to switch to antennas that were on top of the descent stage, uh, which was the portion of the lander that had the rockets. Remember, the rover was tucked inside of this, and it couldn't transmit out because its antennas were covered. So they switched to these antennas, and then, once the rover was lowered down and they were ready to ditch the descent stage, they then had to switch to the rover's antennas. And all of this had to be done seamlessly so that they could keep contact with the rover and figure out what was going on. And it all worked perfectly. They had signals going back to Earth directly at very low bandwidth, but they were also able to do a little bit more bandwidth, nowhere near two megabits per second, uh, but enough bandwidth that they could actually get engineering data back uh, through a relay system that they set up with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And at this link on screen here, you can read up more about how exactly they did all of this. But they basically created what they call a bent pipe. And this allowed for nearly real-time engineering data to make its way back to Earth as the rover landed. So in prior missions, usually what they would get was just a ping that would indicate what step of the landing process that the system was on. But here they were able to get a lot more rich data. And basically the rover was sending out a five second burst of data. They called them five second packets. And those would get sent to the satellite and then fired back to Earth. Now it did take 11 minutes for that data to get to Earth from the satellite, but they were able to collect more of it as it made its way down. And a second orbiting satellite was also recording that data that it would transmit back uh, later in the day if necessary. But all of it worked all the way down, but you just couldn't get enough bandwidth to do video of the landing uh, due to the nature of having to switch all these antennas going from X-band to UHF. There was a lot of engineering and planning that had to go into this, and unfortunately, we're just not there yet uh, when it comes to real-time live video from the surface of the red planet. But now that the rover is on the surface of the planet, it will be using three different antennas to communicate with us back on Earth. Uh, the first two here are what go directly from Mars to Earth with nothing in between. Uh, one of them is the X-band high gain antenna. It transmits between seven and eight gigahertz. And this device will only though transmit data at a rate of about 160 bits per second to a 112 foot antenna uh, located here on Earth. If it picks up the signal on the 230 foot diameter antenna here on Earth, you might be able to get about uh, 800 uh, bits per second. So not very fast here. It's about what you would normally experience with a dial-up modem in the mid 80s perhaps. The max here on the reception is 3000 bits per second. That's basically 3K uh, downstream, a little bit better maybe than a uh, 2400 baud modem perhaps. So this is not gonna be a very efficient way to get video and images back from the surface of Mars. In fact, if you take a look at the first image that the rover transmitted back, uh, this was a 320 by 240 digital image. Uh, the PNG file I downloaded from their website was 56K. It's possible that what they actually send uh, to Earth from the rover is a little bit more compressed, but this image at 56K uh, would take about nine and a half minutes to send to us here on Earth uh, at that very slow data rate. So you would not be able to collect all that much data from the rover using that antenna. Uh, there's also a low gain antenna running on X-band, again, seven to eight gigahertz, but this one is mostly for receiving data and it only gets about 10 bits per second uh, from the 112 foot uh, antenna. If they used the 230 foot antenna here on Earth, it would go at about 30 bits per second. Super, super slow. But this is something that if you had no other way to reach the rover, you could very slowly trickle data down to it through those low speed connections. So what they're going to be using for a bulk of the mission is this cylinder here on the back, because this is the UHF antenna. This doesn't have enough power to reach Earth in a way that would be usable, but it can talk to orbiting satellites that we have on Mars. And there's actually five of them uh, that it can communicate with. And check it out, it can send data at up to two megabits per second uh, from the ground to orbit. And then those satellites will point 
uh, their signals back at Earth and relay the messages. So this is kind of a store and forward concept. The rover is going to store data on its internal memory. When that satellite comes overhead, it will transmit as much data as it can to that satellite. I'm guessing there's some confirmation that it received the data. The data then gets shot back to Earth, and then you have to wait for the next pass before uh, you can continue transmitting data back up. So this is not going to be something like we've got on Earth right now where you can always get a satellite and transmit data to it. You have to wait for that satellite to come back over the horizon again, and there's only five of them, not thousands like uh, Starlink has right now. So it's going to be a while, I think, before we get any kind of real-time streaming from the surface of Mars. Now, the rover communicates with five different satellites overhead, and each of these has its own mission. Uh, they're not there just to relay data. That's one of the things that they do. And each of these satellites is uh, doing its own research and taking its own pictures. And so they have to uh, share the data load with all the data coming back from these other missions as well. And I would imagine it's a very complicated uh, management process, especially given that we've got uh, three things on the ground now, which I'll show you in a minute. Now, each of these orbiters has different data rates in which it can transit data back to us here on Earth. So the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the MRO, can send data at up to four megabits per second. That's pretty quick given the distances involved. It won't always be that fast, but that's kind of the maximum that it can transmit at. I did read some articles that said it could maybe go to five or so, so it'll vary a bit based on conditions, but for the most part, it looks like four megabits per second uh, is its rated max data rate. Uh, the MAVEN orbiter and the trace gas orbiter can do two megabits per second each. Uh, the TGO is a joint project between the European Space Agency and Russia. There's a lot of international collaboration on many of these missions, including the one that we just landed on the planet, which has a lot of European uh, parts to it as well. Uh, the Mars Odyssey orbiter can do 256 k bits per second, and the Mars Express orbiter can do about 230 k bits per second. So those two are the slowest ones there, but they are faster than what the rover could do on its own from the ground. And depending on which satellite picks up which data will determine how fast it all gets back to us here. But in all of these cases, you're not getting this data back in real time, so no, no real time video. And they have to coordinate data from three active missions. Uh, so we have the Mars InSight lander that touched down in November of 2018. Uh, this is a, a stationary lander that's been testing the geology of the planet, among some other things. And you can see how dusty it's gotten uh, sitting on the ground there. They're having a hard time getting power to its uh, batteries because the solar panels are very much covered with dust now. And that's one of the uh, probes that it's using to measure seismic activity. Pretty cool stuff. And they had to solve some really difficult problems to get all of the parts of that lander working. And then you've got Curiosity, which touched down almost nine years ago on August 6, 2012. It has traveled about 15 miles across the surface, about 24 kilometers so far. And it too has picked up a lot of dust, but it is powered by plutonium. So it doesn't have all the issues that you would have with something that had solar panels that could get blocked by all the dust landing on it. So that one's going to go for a couple more years at least, given the lifespan of those power supplies. And then we've got Perseverance, of course, which just landed. It's very similar to Curiosity, but we've got a decade of technological developments that have gone into it since the last one. So we're going to see better quality images, more data, a lot of different science experiments, of course, going on with this one. And I'm very excited to see what kind of data it sends back. But that's a lot of data to manage because uh, these two new rovers, the Curiosity and Perseverance, send back a huge volume of data in fact, Curiosity has sent back about 760,000 images since it landed, and I'm sure Perseverance is going to be doing the same. And of course, we had some video come back from Perseverance also. Now, all of this requires a lot of coordination from the humans on the ground, too, because according to this NASA article, uh, the Curiosity rover and the InSight lander are actually close enough on the planet that every time one of these satellites comes overhead, both of the landers are in range of the satellite. They can all see each other. And because they're transmitting up from the ground at the same frequency, you can't have both landers sending data at the same time. So you've got to schedule 
uh, which one transmits to which orbiter and when. Uh, so there's a lot that goes into this, but they've been doing this for the last 18 years because there's been a lot of overlapping missions on the surface of Mars. And it's really amazing when you think about what goes into making all of this stuff work. In addition to all of the magical engineering that it takes to get something to land on Mars, you got to think about how to get these things to communicate in an efficient way. And then you got to coordinate what happens on the ground here on Earth because there's a limited amount of resources available for listening. And this is a live view of NASA's deep space network that I recorded over the weekend because I happened to catch it when it was communicating with Mars. And you can see there it was picking up a signal from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and it was downloading data at that point at a rate of 2.4 megabits per second. That's the MRO. That's not its maximum rate. Remember, we said it could do about four megabits per second, and there's a whole host of reasons why it's probably less, but that was what it was getting at the time that I was watching. And these antennas, which are located all over the world, are listening to every mission that is out in the solar system and now beyond the solar system. So there's not a lot of time for each device to get its data picked up. So there's a lot of coordination at Mars and a lot of coordination here at Earth. Now here's a couple of other cool things I noticed when I was watching the Deep Space Network over the weekend. Uh, the first here is that it was also getting another downstream signal from the Mars Odyssey orbiter, and that was transmitting at a data rate of 66.36 kbits per second, a little bit faster than a 56k dial-up modem. And then we also caught them sending some data to the Mars Perseverance rover on the ground directly. But as you can see here, that was a pretty slow rate of data transfer, about 2K bits per second. And as I mentioned, the deep space network that NASA manages has to listen to everything that's out there, including stuff that's been up there for a while. Uh, so on Sunday afternoon, as I was capturing this footage, uh, they were also getting signals from Voyager 2, uh, which has been in space since 1977. I was about a year old when that thing launched. That's how long it's been out there for. And it's still transmitting to us back on Earth here at a rate of 160 bits per second. And think about all that has to go into scheduling the antenna time for all of these different space probes that are out there that are running on all sorts of different technology. It's just pretty amazing that all of this is happening and happening so seamlessly to us uh, out here in the general public. Now, if you want to learn more about what's going on with Mars, you can head over to mars.nasa.gov. I've been going to this website for the last 25 years or so as these Martian missions have been picking up, and it looks better than it's ever looked. The information is very well organized now. And one of the cool things about what NASA has been doing with their spacecraft on Mars is that they put up all of the images as they come down, every single one. Uh, you can browse the raw images for Curiosity, the older Opportunity and Spirit missions. You can even find stuff from the Sojourner rover uh, that came down there in 1997. So there's just a ton of resources here that uh, you can spend a lot of time on. And then also check out the NASA Eyes website, which does a lot of real-time data too. They've been really up in their game on uh, informing the public with this stuff and making it make sense. So I would definitely suggest you check this stuff out. You will spend, again, a lot of time there. So hopefully this answers some questions about why we couldn't get real-time video to Mars and all of the challenges in getting data back from the red planet. They make it look easy, but it isn't. And I was really impressed with all that goes into it as I was researching the video today. And I'd love to hear what you think about it down below in the comment stream. Now, this week's wrap up, as always, is being brought to you by all of you. And we had some super chatters this week that I want to thank. First of all, Chanfle98 made a nice contribution during our Mars Landing live stream. I also received some super chats from Grayson Petty, Living Two Live 619, and Toys Are for Boys on some other uh, live streams that we did. So I want to thank you all for your generous contributions to the channel. Uh, we also have some new supporters on the channel this week. They include Josh Charles, John Roberts, and Hazanat. All of them contributed via the YouTube membership program with that join button down below. So I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis. And I also want to thank you all who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth, and I greatly appreciate the support. You can support the channel at lon.tv support, which brings you over to my donor box page where you can make a monthly or a one-time contribution 
We also support Patreon, the YouTube membership program, and Floatplane. So wherever you want to help, I am happy to be there to be helped. So thank you all very much again for your support. You can check out my other channels listed here on screen, including my podcast, which is an audio version of this show. We have other ways to engage with the channel, including my email list, which I recently rehashed, and I'm doing a little bit more email these days, so I apologize if you've gotten a little bit too much. And then we also have the store where I sell previously used items, and we have a separate email list for that. So if you go to lon.tv slash store alert, you will get an email every time I add something to the store. And I've got a bunch of docking stations that I've been accumulating here for a while that I'm going to start getting rid of this week. So be on the lookout, subscribe to that email, and once things get listed, you will be alerted when we've got stuff that you can pick up. So thank you all for your continued viewership and support. And I was very pleased with how well the live stream did of that Mars landing. So I might do a few more things like that in the near future. And until next time, this is Lon Sybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Jim Peter, Tom Albrecht, Frank Lewandowski, Mark Bollinger, and Chris Allegretta. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.